Hello, everybody. This is Brian from Necronomicast. Thank you for tuning in for this exciting 13th season of the show. Couldn't do it without you. Now, if you're ever wondering if there was a, a kind of a fun and inexpensive way that you could support the production of the show, I've got news for you. You can go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash Necronomicast. Every time I have an author on the show, I've purchased their book. Whenever a documentary filmmaker or a creative person is on the show to talk about their project, you know I've supported their project. So if you go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash Necronomicast, that will enable me to continue to do the work that I do here on the show. So I thank you so very much from the bottom of my heart for all of the support and encouragement you've given me over the years. And uh, you know what? If you buy me a cup of coffee at the website, I would be more than happy to deliver a personalized message to you on the show. Two or more cups of coffee, you're going to get something in the mail. Buymeacoffee.com forward slash Necronomicast. And now, on with the show. From the historic haunted heartland of Omaha, Nebraska, my name is Brian Corey, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all, young and old, to this episode of Necronomicast, the finest in creepy conversations. To start my 13th season of the show off with a bang, I have the return of celebrated author Leslie Rule. You might remember her from a few episodes back, well, a few years back. I had her on to discuss her fantastic book, A Tangled Web, a true crime masterpiece. She's back to her roots with her newest book, Haunted in America, true ghost stories from the best of the Leslie Rule collection. So sit back and relax, turn down the lights, and get ready for a master of paranormal writing, Leslie Rule, on this episode of Necronomicast. Here she is kicking off my 2023 programming. On the Newsmaker Hotline, I have the pleasure of welcoming back to the show my friend, Leslie Rule. Leslie, how are you? I am great. How are you doing? I'm doing so, so well. Um, getting ready to kick off another year in Necronomicast, and what a treat to have you on the show. And uh, I got a copy of your your newest book, Haunted in America. Man, is it ever... It's so It's so nice to have... I have all these great writers on, but you have such a gift of writing. And Oh, thank you. I mean, some people, you know, write very well, but you just have such like a like a flair and and just such an uncommon touch to writing that like it's such a great book. And and to have you on the program, what a, what a treat. I appreciate that very much. I love being here. And what's funny, <laughs> I think I said this on the last time I had you on the show. Uh I had you on because of your masterful book, your true crime book, uh, A Tangled Web, that dealt with a, a hideous, horrible crime and situation here in the heartland. And I didn't know at the time, I was researching like, you know, this case and how it impacted my community. And then to have you on uh, talking about your your the book that you wrote about it. And I had no idea, or a very small idea, I, I didn't know... Th- all the books that you had written about the paranormal and about ghost stories and uh-huh. about and about all of your explorations into the unknown. And so I'm super excited to have you back on the show just to talk just about your your ghost travels and your and all the adventures that you've had uh, hunting the supernatural. I love talking about ghosts. Have you ever seen one? I have not. I don't think so. <laughs> well, yeah, because you don't always know because you right. don't know sometimes until they disappear right before your eyes. That's, if you're out and about and you see somebody on the street, you you can't tell if it's a ghost. I've heard that so many times. And and I uh, I work at church. I work at a church. And so there's times when you're kind of, you know, moving around the building and you're walking around and you see just like one solitary person uh, in, in the pew, maybe just praying, you know, for discernment, uh-huh. you know, they're just, they're just, uh, by themselves praying. And then you walk right past that area again and they're gone. Uh-huh. Well, and you don't know if they just kind of slipped out or if they're in the restroom or if they, you know, drop their glasses and they're on their hands and you know what I mean? Like, right. Right. So when people say, well, have you seen a ghost? I'm like, I, I, I don't know. I, uh-huh. <laughs> I don't know, but Boy, you sure have uh, gone all over the country looking looking for the supernatural. I mean, in your book, now this newest book, and I want to talk about this newest book that you have, Haunted in America. It's the true ghost stories 
from the best of Leslie Rule collection. So you've written, let me go to your, let me look at your page here that says all the books that you've written. Because this is kind of like a greatest hits, but it's updated. So it's got a lot of brand new material. Yes, there's at least 100 pages of new stories. And then I've updated the older ones because I started doing this 25 years ago. And at that time, it was my goal to dive into news archives and find something that happened in the past that could cause uh, a haunting at a particular location. And at that time, I had to get on an airplane and fly across the country to whatever city I was investigating. And it wasn't easy because not everything was cataloged. Um, most cities had a library with a reference section or a newspaper office, and they would allow you to go through the, um, their old papers. But for instance, in Whitefish, Montana, it was not cataloged at all. They said, sure, go ahead, look through our papers. And you know, 100 years worth of papers were stacked on tables, not in any order. So it was an arduous task. And now it was such a pleasure to update. And I didn't have to get off my couch because now <laughs> I can I can subscribe to news archives and read literally millions of newspaper articles and never have to get up. Don't have to get on a plane to do it. And I was able to find information about stories I wrote a quarter of a century ago information I could not find back then. So I added some very interesting updates. Oh, absolutely. And I want to talk about some of them. And and there's also some things there's like, there's tidbits about you and your friends when you go out on these adventures and you're, and you're uh, going all, all these different places and traveling. Like you have your, you have your team, it seems like, like you have your best friends uh, that, that accompany you. And I didn't know that you um, worked with, or you you know, you did some supernatural exploration with um, Debbie Costantino, the late Debbie Costantino. Yes, Debbie and Mark. Yeah. I used to really uh, enjoy watching them on television because they always seem to be getting just remarkable evidence. And for people that don't know, Debbie and Mark Costantino, longtime um, paranormal investigators, they really had just such groundbreaking work with EVPs, uh, collecting EVPs. And it just seemed like they always had, I don't want to say the best luck, but I mean, it just seemed like their techniques and what they did, or maybe just their own psychical energy would, would attract these voices, yes. voices from the unknown. Debbie was very sensitive. And when a psychic is present, when people are either trying to get ghostly photographs or EVP, there tends to be better results. Somehow they open a door mm -hmm. and I've, I've seen her in action I mean, she's not even trying. She wasn't even trying to be psychic, but I remember we went to, to Denver and we, uh, it was Debbie Constantino and Janice Oberding and I, and we were crossing a street near the Oxford hotel. And Debbie says, it feels like there's tunnels under this street. And it was her first time in town. None of us had been there before. And the next day, while Janice and Debbie were doing their investigation, I went to the library to search archives. And I found an article that said that historians have long suspected that at one time there was a tunnel beneath that street that connected the train station with the hotel so that important guests could arrive without being seen. Yeah. That was just one example of something I saw her do that was pretty impressive. Yeah. And, and of course, people that follow the paranormal and, and the supernatural know that uh, Debbie and Mark uh, lost their lives uh, a number of years ago. Tragic situation, kind of domestic violence. Um, so just to read your book and to, you know, bring her back up uh kind of not, I don't want to say modern times, yeah. but bring it up in, to, to more recent times and kind of re, re talk about her and how her work was important. I thought that was a nice touch. And, and, and I didn't know that you guys had worked together, but reading about the Oxford hotel. Yeah. Well, when I first met Debbie and Mark, they were just starting out and we went to the Donner Memorial park together mm. with Janice. 
and got some very interesting EVP. That, of course, is the spot where the pioneers were stranded a century and a half ago and ended up starving. And some of them resorted to cannibalism just to survive. And they showed they showed us how it worked. They showed me and Janice how the EVP recordings worked and, the, and we participated. And at that time, Mark and Debbie were just starting out. They hadn't given any talks yet. Um, they weren't on TV yet. And I featured an article about them in the book I was working on, which was When the Ghost Screams, because I was so impressed with them. And I thought they were both very kind people. They love their pets like I do. And we kind of bonded over that. So it was an absolute shock to learn that they died in a, in a murder-suicide and that uh, Mark shot his wife and a friend of hers and himself. I was blown away because that, that was not the situation that I witnessed. They seemed to be very kind people. So it was, it was very, very sad. I, was, I didn't find out it happened until about two or three years afterward. I hadn't been in close touch with them at that time. And one day I turned on the TV and I thought, oh, I'm going to see what Debbie and Mark are up to. So I went to YouTube and I put in EVP, Debbie and Mark, and a video instantly pops up. And I think it's going to be a video of Mark and Debbie collecting EVP. Instead, it's someone I don't know, a paranormal investigator saying he's trying to contact the ghost of Debbie. Oh, and wow. I was stunned and I thought, what? The goat, did she die? And then I started to research and learned that they, they both died uh, violently. And it was especially interesting because Janice, Debbie and I had all stayed together at the Oxford Hotel in Denver, Colorado. And we stayed in the murder room, room 320. And there was a murder suicide there. Um, the case that I learned about, I think there may have been more than one. It was the female shot her lover who was married mm. and then shot herself. And Debbie became very, very frightened while we were there. Um, I wasn't scared because I just was determined not to be afraid of ghosts when I started investigating this. But both Janice and Debbie became afraid and they wouldn't be in the room by themselves. And I was in a separate room and they were in a front room uh, one night and they had been working all day trying to collect EVP. And now they're trying to go to sleep and all of a sudden they're hearing voices. And Debbie said it sounded like two men talking to each other and they were sitting on the couch. She couldn't see them, but she could hear them. And they were mumbling. Um, she couldn't quite make out what they were saying. And then she, it felt like somebody just touched their fingers too lightly to her stomach. And she told Janice, hey, I'm really afraid. Will you come crawl into the bed with me? <laughs> so she did. And I think I wrote about that the first time in When the Ghost Screams. But then when I revisited that story, I said that it was almost as if it frightened her because she was seeing her own future without mm -hmm. realizing it. She was seeing what her terrible fate was going to be. It was to be a, a victim of a murder suicide. So that was very interesting to think back on that and how very frightened Debbie became. Yeah. Yeah, and you just you just mentioned this uh, a second ago that you when you were doing this investigation, you you decided that you were not going to be afraid. So you're kind of looking at it more from a like a left brain analytical approach, like what's going on here, very maybe scientific or very measured in your approach. You just decided that you're not going to be afraid. Well, I, I grew up in a haunted house and I was scared right. a little bit when I was a kid. Right. But my parents um, told us that it was my great grandfather that was haunting the house. And so he had been a Methodist minister and I thought of him as a protector. And I wasn't afraid of him, but there was some other weird stuff going on. Um, the property was built on a graveyard. And I think there was um, definitely more than one entity. But as I grew older, I became less frightened with the idea and came to believe that 
it's actually a very encouraging idea that our spirits live on after we die. And if you can prove the existence of ghosts, then you can prove that life goes on when our bodies die. Mm -hmm. So in general, I'm not frightened by it. I know there are things out there that I don't want to explore. I don't want to learn about, but what I study is haunted places that seem to be haunted by the spirits of human beings, not evil people, but people who died on or near the premises. Mm -hmm. And I see them often as being tra like trapped animals mm. that really need our compassion and not our fear. Because when it's a situation where the ghost seems rooted to a spot, I may be confused about where they are and what's going on. Then it's a different scenario than if, let's say, your grandma passes away. And then she appears by your bed that night and smiles at you and um, maybe shows up every so often over the years. She's not a trap ghost. She's a spirit that's moved on to the great beyond, but comes back to visit. So if there is a distinction and neither idea frightens me. Yeah, that's interesting. Like when I think about and read about so much of that, I read about if you go back like through this stuff, through the. Society for Psychical Research and stuff. So many, a majority of all these quote unquote hauntings and, and ghosts and apparitions are for, from loved ones very close to death or or they have just passed. Uh, maybe just saying goodbye or, or, or things like that. So yeah, not necessarily things that you would have to be scared of in any way. You know, it's people always say to me or remark like, oh, you're, you're, you're into that creepy, weird stuff, into ghosts and, and all that. And, but in a lot of ways, we're just looking for more life. It's like, it's very, it's like giving a voice to those that don't have a voice. You know, it's, it's, yes. you know, I'm not patting myself on the back saying I'm just a great guy, but it's like, we're looking for, you know, we're extending compassion to those that if people are trapped, what a horrible thing to be, you know, trapped in a location, especially if you're sad. Well, well, you know, so I, I, I appreciate the fact that we, that you're not like a Leslie rule demon hunter or. No, <laughs> I stay away from that. Right. No, I, I, it's, if a place is believed to be um, infested with demons, I don't go near it. Right. And, and, and also to that point, like, I don't, it's so hard for me. Like you asked me at the beginning of this, uh, this interview, if, if I had seen a ghost. Now, obviously you have seen what you consider ghosts. You, you've seen them. I Yes, I have. Yeah. Not very often, but a few times sure, over sure. the years. Yeah. And, but we don't, you know, we research and we read and we talk and speculate and that's all super <laughs> fun. But, you know, I, I don't know what a ghost really is. You know, so if I saw one or something materialize and, and, and kind of dissolve, uh, away, what am I seeing? Am I seeing, uh, an intelligent spirit that's just kind of coming and going? Am I seeing uh, a time thing from the past? Am I seeing something from the future? I mean, it, it's, yeah. yeah, it's, it's just, it, it's so much fun. <laughs> well, the theory is there's the place memory, mm -hmm. um, where a dramatic scenario can be inexplicably imprinted upon the environment and played back at a later date where witnesses can actually see it. And this kind of situation, the, the ghosts, the apparitions that are being seen are actually not connected to people who died, but people who may have had something dramatic occur there. And now they've moved on and they're fine and alive and they're in another state, but there's a little, almost like a movie left behind that people can actually witness. Um, for instance, at the Hotel Conneaut, for years, people said that they saw in the downstairs kitchen, two chefs fighting and they were throwing knives at each other and pots and pans. And this had been reported many times over the years. And I always thought it sounded like a place memory because it, it was uh, something that was reenacted 
and there were two people involved and they were interacting with each other. So I wasn't able to get to the bottom of that one when I first investigated that back around 2002. But with this new book, I searched archives every day for weeks trying to find everything I could about the Hotel Conneaut. And I actually discovered uh, over a century ago, there was a fight in the kitchen between two chefs that was dramatic enough that it was uh, reported by a local uh, paper. It was on, on one of the back pages. I think it was 1908, if I remember correctly. And these two men got in a fight and they were throwing knives at each other and pots and pans. And somebody stepped in and broke up the fight. And that man was injured, but nobody died. Right. So I thought that was fascinating. That must have been a hell of a fight. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> to be well, and to they be, say that the emotion that goes on right. is what can quite possibly make the scenario so intense that it can be played back. And it's not that different from when we watch an old movie on TV. It's just that we don't understand how that became imprinted upon the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Like I, I just think about you know, these two guys are having beef with each other down in that kitchen. And we're talking about <clears throat> all the emotions leading up to that fight as well. It might have been stewing in with those two guys for weeks about how something was going on in the kitchen. Yeah. Something, you know, they, there, there might have been a huge buildup. And then that fight was just when it popped off and and that energy kind of floats around. And it was written about in the paper. I thought that was great that you wrote about that too. Like you did your due diligence and you found out what was going on. Like, why are these two spirits seem to be knocking, knocking heads? Well, yeah, <laughs> the, mis <laughs> the mystery still is like, why? But there's like, there's co corroborating evidence that there was a fight in the kitchen. It actually <laughs> happened. People talked about for years witnessing this. Isn't that great that you went through there and you read all that and then you found, you, you found like, oh my God, there was a, it was written about in the paper. That's, that's well, a, <laughs> and there was something else that uh, it took me a long time to find, but for years, people would talk about uh, a ghost of a bride that died at the Hotel Kania in a fire. Oh, uh, yeah. I believe they call her Elizabeth. And I searched and searched and searched and I could find no evidence of that happening there. But I did find that two young women in the early 1900s uh, went out on a, a boat ride there and drowned. Um, they went out with a couple of young men mm -hmm. and two of the women and one of the guys drowned because the boat had a leak in it. And that was an era, early 1900s, when that would have, that white long gown that a bride would wear was similar in appearance to what women wear to be fa fashionable back then mm -hmm. with those long flowing dresses. And over the years, people have seen this apparition floating down the hall and she's wearing this long white dress. And they assume that that's the ghost in the legend. But I think it was uh, one of these two women. Yeah. Um, they actually worked at the Hotel Virginia, which was directly behind the Hotel Conneaut, just a few feet away. The hotels were uh, under the same ownership. And people would leave the uh, Hotel Virginia to um, walk through the lobby of the Hotel Conneaut to get to the lake. And so that was actually a path that these women would have taken in life. And that's where the ghost has been seen. Yeah. And you kind of touched on something else too. And now I have pictures of my dad, my dad and listeners of the program uh, have heard this a million times, but my dad was born in 1904. He was 70 when I was born. Wow. Yeah, right? Older than my grandparents. <laughs> yeah, I get that a lot. So <laughs> I always have to drop that card on there because people are like, what? <laughs> so, but I have pictures of my dad, you know, from that era and, and photographs from that era are very rare. However, my dad, uh, as a boy, as a young boy, you know, the, they had like ringleted hair and they- Right, and the it, Lord Fauntleroy look. Right, right. And they wore, so, so if there was ever- 
a spirit of a child from that era or whatnot, people would assume, oh, it's probably a little girl. Well, no, it's, it was my, you it know. It could be a little boy. It could definitely. be. Yeah. So when you see, you know, when what we see or what we interpret when that happens, when we see something like that, uh, it, our modern eyes and our modern sensibility doesn't always, you know, uh, decode the story. Uh, accurately. So it, it could that's be, so true. Yeah. So I mean, like and that actually reminds me of the, um, did, did you happen to read the story about the hotel St. James in Cimarron, New Mexico? Mm -hmm. And I revisited that story in my book and that place is extremely haunted. Um, there were quite a few gunfights there of uh, Jesse James, Annie Oakley, Buffalo Bill, they all hung out there. Yeah. And to this day, there are still bullet holes in the ceiling of the bar. Right. But in addition to that, uh, for years, people would see um, a little figure they called the imp from the corner of their eyes, a little figure with blonde hair, and they never got a good look. Um, but one day, uh, a young man went to work in, I believe it was his first day, and he was interviewed on Unsolved Mysteries. And he was trying to clean up, um, getting ready for the day when he noticed a child sitting on the bar and he uh, he was sit the kid was sitting there spinning a bottle. So um, the young man walked up to him and said, hey, kid, uh, you're not supposed to be down here. You better go back up to your room. At that moment, the child looked up at him and half of his face was horribly burned. Mm. Um, it scarred as if it had been burned. And he noted that the little figure had long blonde hair to his shoulders and uh, was wearing what looked like a white nightgown. Yet he sensed it was a little boy. And then the little guy jumped off the bar and disappeared into the floor. <laughs> so when I visited there, I was, I had a few weird things happen. And one of them was I was woken up very early in the morning um, with the sensation that little, little hand had patted my face. And my friend uh, Sherry and I were investigating together. We'd spent the night there and we had to get uh, to the airport so I could fly home. But I wanted to stop at the at the nearby uh, graveyard first to see if I could figure out who the ghost was of the kid that had been seen on the counter. Cause I'd seen the unsolved mystery episode. Right. And so we, we walked through the cemetery and I found the Lambert family plot and they were the Lamberts were the longtime owners of the hotel oh. um, back in the day. Okay. And Henry Lambert was the father and he was the chef at one time he cooked for Abraham Lincoln. And I saw this grave of a little boy that had died in the 1890s and he was two and a half. His name was Johnny. And I called my friend over and I said, I found him. And she looked at the grave and she said, uh, no, I don't think this could be him because Unsolved Mysteries showed uh, in their reenactment an older boy. And I said, well, they may have taken creative license because oh, yeah. it was just a reenactment. And I said, I want to talk to the kid who, who saw the ghost. So when I got home, um, I tracked down, not the, the witness himself, but the witness's father. And that man told me, my son does not like to talk about this. Mm. Uh, he, he won on Unsolved Mysteries, but that's it. It was too upsetting to him. But I can tell you exactly what he told me. And he said um, he was a little boy and he was um, si sitting on the bar and he described the scarred face and the, uh, the long blonde hair and nightgown. And I said, well, how old of a boy? And he said, a little boy. My son said it was a little boy. And I sa said, you mean a toddler? And he said, yes. Wow. And I thought it was very interesting that the witness picked up on the fact that it was a male child, because if I had seen somebody with the long blonde hair wearing a nightgown, I would assume that it was um, a little girl. Well, I consulted a famous psychic, Nancy Meyer, and had her read some of the photographs 
um, from the places I was investigating when I was writing Coast to Coast Ghosts. And when she read the St. James photo, she tuned into uh, quite a few ghosts. Now, she didn't know anything about the location of the spot or the people that lived there, but she did pick up on the spirit of a little boy. And I asked her if there was something wrong with his face. And she said he was burned. Wow. And she said he didn't, he didn't die from the burns right away, but he eventually did. Um, and she said that he was running through the kitchen and he ran into somebody carrying a big pot of fried food and um, they were burned. And so was, so was the little boy. And I thought that was fascinating, but I was unable at that time to find anything that would confirm what she told me. But Henry Lambert um, did work as the chef. That was Johnny's father. Wow. Um, so that would make sense that the kids would be there. Yeah. And, and as I recently was researching, I did find an article um, about Johnny's death, and they mentioned that he died of diphtheria, which was another thing that Nancy had tuned in on. She said that there were children who had died at that hotel uh, in the late 1800s of that very disease. And it turned out uh, Johnny did have that. And that was the ultimate cause of his death, according to this very, very brief article I found. But the article did not say whether or not Johnny had been burned. And if that was a contributing factor to his death, yeah. that remains a mystery. But so much, of, so many of the other things she told me turned out to be true. Um, I suspect that that very well could have been the cause of his death. Sure. Do you ever um, speculate about how a spirit might present itself to us in terms of what era of their life they might? That's interesting because there are reports of um, ghostly figures appearing in various places that people have uh, surmised belong to a particular person who lived and died on the spot, but that person died uh, when they were elderly and the apparition scene might be that person as they looked when they were a child or a teenager or, or middle-aged. So one theory is that people take on the appearance of a time of life that they enjoyed mm -hmm. or that it was important to them. Now, of course, we don't know if any of that's true. Right. Um, I always make it very clear that I don't have the answers. Um, I, I lean toward many of the theories about ghosts, but I can't say for certain if any of it's true because nothing's been proven scientifically. Oh yeah. We can't conjure up a ghost in a lab and see that it's, you know, X amount of carbon or, or, or yeah. the, you know what I mean? But I, I had this conversation with a uh, paranormal uh, researcher, John Tenney, and we were kind of speculating about stuff and, and like, uh, you know, if I, you know, when, when Brian Corey is 99 years old or 110 and I pass away and I have a chance to kind of visit some places that were important to me when I was in life, I, I don't know if I want to be 99 or 110 year old Brian Corey. I might want to be, <laughs> I might, I might want to be 47 year old Brian Corey, you know, like I am now, or, yeah. or I might be uh, Brian in his mid twenties when I had a full head of hair, you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't yeah. know. I don't know how I, if I have a chance to present myself uh, or, you know, uh, who knows what the rules are <laughs> if we're allowed to take on a, a particular appearance. Yeah. And that's what's so interesting about uh, all these things, because you hear about, uh, you know, like the stereotypical kind of just regular woman in white. Uh -huh. and, and she might be in her 20s or 30s. Well, maybe she passed away in her 80s and 90s and she wants to in that place that she's seen is important to her uh, when she was in her twenties or thirties. Yes. You know what I mean? So it's just, it, I know what you mean about no definitive statements about the paranormal. That's what makes it for me fun to kind of speculate about like, what, what is this mystery? What is this all about? I know. I, I love a mystery and this is the greatest um, self mystery of all time. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I have to, this is funny. I was reading through here in your book and then you wrote about, 
uh, a place not too far from where I record this show, the Elms Resort in Excelsior Springs, uh, Missouri. Yes. And that's about three hours away. Super short drive. We drive to Kansas City all the time. That's about four hours away. So from my house to uh, uh, the Elms Resort would be about three. And I was like, hmm, I was reading about this. And I texted my wife in the other room because I was reading in the bedroom. She was working in the kitchen or whatever. And I'm like, hey, we should check out this place, uh, you know, like a couple's weekend or whatever. And she's like, hmm. And then then she kind of was like, wait, is this is this one of those haunted places? <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I really enjoyed reading about uh, the Elms Resort and the caretaker there or the maintenance man that gives ghost tours there, Jay. Yes, today he gives the ghost tours. And his name's Jay Fanning over there. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Great, great, uh, great stories that you documented in your book about that place and the healing waters that it was built upon. Yeah, it turned out to be a scam, but um, <laughs> years ago, I'm glad you said believed, it. I didn't want to say it. <laughs> well, the, the whole town was very popular and thousands would um, would travel to the city with the mistaken belief that the waters had healing powers. Right. And it wasn't until the 1960s when a, a magazine debunked that, that people realized. And I think that a lot of people were cured through the placebo effect, because if you believe you're going to be healthy, you will be healthy. Mm -hmm. And the same can happen. You can make yourself sick just by believing that you're sick. Mm -hmm. Now, in many instances, people ended up dying because they were too far gone. And people got out of their deathbeds to go there and die. I mean, they thought they were going there to heal. Um, but as you can imagine, that didn't always happen. Yeah, this place so, didn't, I want to make it clear, this place didn't kill them. But they no, went, no, no, no. But they went to the place on their hoping. deathbeds, hoping that it would give them a reprieve of some health. Uh, yes. And and sadly, you know, they just went there and passed away. Uh, and the and the Elms was not the only hotel in in town back in the day. Yeah. Um, there were dozens. Now it's the only hotel left. Uh, people travel there to visit because it's a it's a cool spot. It's um. It's historic, and some people like the fact that it's haunted. Uh, it's now owned by the city. But some of the things that happen are kind of interesting. Like, I talked to a guy who told me about the fifth grade class was on a field trip, and they were on one of the upper floors when a little girl ran past the group and disappeared into the wall. Yeah. And the story was that every kid in that class claimed that they saw this. I looked for weeks. I could not find documentation of a child who died at that particular place. Though there, there were plenty of kids that died there. Uh, it was just hard to determine where it happened. Right. And how unique that is that all those kids, it is said that all those kids saw or witness this apparition yes. in, cause that doesn't happen very often where you have many people seeing the same thing all at once. It's usually just a very kind of a personal interaction, like the intimate experience in a lot of ways. Well, it, it seems to be that there are often cases when a whole group of people will witness something. And then a lot of cases when only one person sees it and everyone else is asking them, what are you talking about? I didn't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> right. That happened to me in the 1980s. I saw um, the, the ghost of a young man that I worked with. I was waitressing at the time. And um, Scott was this great, great kid. He was a, a cook there. He was a few years younger than I was. I was in my late 20s and he had just turned 21. And he and his friend were out drinking one rainy Sunday night and they drank too much. and there was a fatal accident. Mm. They were killed. And there were four people in the other car oh. that were sent to the hospital with life-threatening injuries. And I don't know what became of them, but everybody at the restaurant was devastated. Um, Scott was a passenger. He wasn't driving. He was a very, very uh, nice kid. He's so proud of his job. And about a year after that, uh, my uh, first husband um, 
Dave and I were driving along. It was Furwood Road in Lake Oswego, Oregon, which was right up the street from the restaurant where I worked, which was the Walrus and the Carpenter, kind of a classy seafood place. There you go. And as um, this road was just absolutely filled with potholes and the potholes were filled with water. And so Dave was driving very slowly. And all of a sudden, as we passed under a streetlight, I saw Scott and he was wearing his favorite coat. Uh, it was this long coat he was really proud of that kind of had a rock star look to it. His face was tilted up and he was crying. There were tears rolling down his face. And my first instinct was I reached up my hand and I pointed and I said, there's Scott's ghost. And then at that moment later, we'd gone past. And then I started laughing at myself. I said, oh, no, it was Dustin. It had to be Dustin because Scott had a younger brother who worked as a dishwasher. And I thought, oh, Scott put on um, or Dustin put on Scott's coat and he's walking around in the round in the rain crying because he misses his brother. Mm. And um, 30 seconds later, we had pulled into our driveway and I, I leapt out of the car and I ran down the street to look for what I thought was Dustin because I thought I have to bring him back to the house, give him tea, comfort him, talk to him. There was no sign of him. And I ran up and down that street calling his name. Um, all the houses were buttoned up for the night. The lights were out. I should have been able to look down that stretch of road and seen anybody that was a quarter of a mile down the street. Sure. But there was no sign of him. And I just assumed it was Dustin because I thought there's no way that a ghost would be so solid and real. I could see them tears on their face and yeah. in the coat. And this was years before I wrote about ghosts. And a few years later, uh, probably over a decade later, I was writing about ghosts and on the radio a lot, talking about how to spot a, a ghost. And one of the things I would say is uh, that sometimes only one person will see it. Now, my husband, Dave, did not see him. And I, that I was, was going to be my question. Yeah, I was really annoyed. I thought, how could you not have seen him? He was just a couple of feet from your side of the car. And he was annoyed at me. Like, what are you talking about? There was nobody there. And I thought, oh, he's got to get his eyes checked. <laughs> and I, I did not at that time, after that first initial response, I did not even revisit the idea that I had seen a ghost. Many years went by. It was about 2011 and I was waking up one morning and those lazy thoughts that drift through your brain, memories. And all of a sudden I remembered seeing Dust, Dustin, I thought, who I thought was Dustin, walking down the road, crying in his brother's coat. And for the first time, I realized that the characteristics sounded like those of a ghost sighting. He seemed to have disappeared very quickly. He wasn't there when I ran to ch check on him. Yeah. He had, um, he, I could, only I could see him. My husband couldn't see him. And I thought, he, you know, Dustin didn't even really look that much like his brother. So I, I had been so desperate for a logical uh, explanation that I had immediately latched onto the idea. So I, I thought, he's, Dustin might think I'm crazy but I'm going to find him and I'm going to send him an email and tell him. I found him on Facebook. I sent him a note, no response. Mm. So another decade went by and it was just about this time last year when I was thinking about it again as I was getting ready to write this book. So I found Dustin online. I found a phone number for him. He picked up on the second ring he had no memory of me from the restaurant, um, but he was really glad that I called. Oh. We had a great conversation. He said that was absolutely not him um, walking down the street wearing his brother's coat. He said he did have some of Scott's clothing, but it was years before he wore it, wore them. He didn't remember the coat. I think that Scott was wearing it the night that he died. And, and that's probably why um, Dust, Dustin did not remember it. And he did not think I was crazy. He's very open-minded. And I asked him, can I put this in the book? 
because I didn't want to invade upon his privacy and people have different opinions about ghosts. And I just didn't want to write something that would be upsetting to him. And he said, absolutely. So I wrote the story and I let him read it and he liked it. And it's in this new book. Yeah. This new book that we're talking about, this, this haunted in America. Uh, what a great story. Uh, I'm glad it turned out good that you were able to include it in the book and that his memory can kind of go on and you can talk about, uh, you know, Scott. Yes. And I wanted to put a positive spin on it. And now again, I don't have all the answers, but when I thought about it, I wondered why did Scott appear to me? Mm -hmm. And one of the leading theories is that, that ghosts know the future. And if that's true, when the ghost saw me, he was very aware that I was going to one day write books about ghosts. And I thought he wants his story told and he, he wants another reminder out there that people should not drink and drive mm. and they shouldn't let their friends drink and drive. And that's why he had tears rolling down his face. Yeah. That makes sense to me that he wanted that message. He wanted to show the world that he was sorry. That's a lot of pain to a lot of people. And it was not Scott driving, but he was in the car with his friend. Yeah. So that's what I concluded. Whether or not that's true, I don't know. And I think a lot of times when you read through these stories and just all, all these stories, uh, stories of hauntings throughout history, so many times they are meant just to be like little reminders or or little signals or little warnings or or just ways to let people know that they're there. Uh, that their spirit kind of continues on and kind of maybe in a sign of reassurance that things can be okay. Uh, but, yes. but, but also, like you said, you know, you know, like that, you know, kind of remind people of the dangers of drunk driving or tragedies that can happen. You know, yes. so we don't know what they're trying to tell us when they appear to us or what that's all about, but it, it's good that you, that you witnessed it, thought about it, reached out got the story, made the updates. I mean, it's just, it's just an, another great story that's in this, that's in this book. Uh, well, I also wrote a book about angels called Where Angels Tread, True Stories of Miracles and Angelic Intervention. That's one of my favorite books, but it didn't sell as well as the ghost books. Oh. <laughs> and I used one of the stories from that book in Haunted in America, uh, because we can't say whether or not this entity that assisted this woman was an angel or an, or a ghost. Um, but right. it was in the 1970s. Uh, her name's Sharon. Sharon was working as a counselor at a horse camp and she had a sweet tooth. So once a week or so, she would drive into town and she would stock up on candy. She would visit this little um, stop and go. And one day, as she pulled into the parking lot, she saw that there was a figure standing in the doorway. And it materialized from the waist up. She couldn't tell if it was male or female, but it was shaking its head no. And she saw this very clearly, but she questioned herself. And she thought, ah, maybe I'm just imagining it. So she wasn't going to leave. And she, she, she turned away for a minute. And she looked back. It was still there. And it was just no. And she knew, she didn't feel that this entity wanted to harm her. But it was warning her, do not go into the store. So she drove away. And the next day, she learned that around the same time she was there, the store had been robbed. And the clerk had been shot and killed. Oh. And her uh, instinct then was guilt. And she said, I, I could have done something. I, maybe I could have saved their life. But there was nothing that an 18-year-old girl could have done no. against a man with a gun. Right. And I think it's quite possible that the entity she saw was the ghost of the clerk who had just been murdered. That was warning her not to come in. 
Now, it could have been her guardian angel. Mm -hmm. I can't say for certain, but I, I get chills when I talk about this because it's an example of the things that spirits can do to help us that when people move to the other side, they may have some control and they may be able to actually rescue people or warn people. I, I totally believe that. And I'm glad that you go down that road in your book and in your investigations because so many of these stories, not just your stories, but w- when we hear instances of sp- spirits either warning us or trying to help us out, it it lends myself or it lends... I like to go down the road that not all these paranormal things are scary and we don't have to be necessarily thrill seekers. And when we go into a haunted location, we're talking about human beings and we're talking about people and most people in my heart, Leslie, (laughs) in my heart, I believe most people are good. And yes, I do too. And most, I agree. And most people are kind and most people are helpful and most people are compassionate. And I like to think that after we pass, whatever persists, after our bodily death, I think those positive traits remain. And if you had the opportunity to warn an 18-year-old girl uh, about a crime, if you had the opportunity to warn somebody on the side of the road to slow down and drive carefully and not drink, if you had the opportunity to, you know, fill in the blank. Uh, yes. And you had, and you were not of this earth anymore <laughs> that if you had some kind of power and inkling to help somebody that you would. And so I, I like those stories. I like, I don't always like the stereotypical scary ghost, pull my hair or push, yeah. push it down the stairs kind of thing. I, I, I tend to think that a lot of these things, because these ghosts reveal themselves to us or these spirits reveal to themselves to us, that it, it, it's, it's a positive human interaction. Somehow. I think so too. And I think that Hollywood works overtime to make ghost stories scary and they don't need to be scary. No, they make a hell of a lot of money though. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know why people are attracted to the scary ghost stories because if I'm watching a documentary and the minute I realize, oh, well, the producers are trying to frighten people, I turn it off. I'm not interested. Yeah, it's not. It's 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 pretty stereotypical, and it's. An, I think it's an easy way out to you know to to use a ghost or a sp- spooky story as 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 something to frighten you. I mean, I get it because we're all scared yeah. of the unknown. But my goodness, uh, between your Tangled Web book and your mom's true crime books, we don't need to go looking for the unknown to be scared. There's plenty of scary uh, um, demons, if you want to call it, that are living human beings yes. right here on earth. <laughs> well, I don't think that, as I said earlier, I don't think that ghosts are scary. Right. Now, the killers in my mom's book and the killer in my book, A Tangled Web, she's very scary. Ooh, Liz, uh, the God. murderer. Um, so it's the live people we have to watch out for. Yes. Now, in the in the minutes that we have remaining, though, uh, I was reading through and you have, a, you have a section about haunted schools and you have a list of some some haunted locations that are schools in the back. And I, I kind of, I jumped when, when you wrote one in here, let me see if I can find it real quick, because I went to school for college at the university of Nebraska, Lincoln. And you mentioned the university of Nebraska, Lincoln briefly in your book, when you're talking about schools, um, Da, 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 da. See if I can find it. Yes. This isn't a, a sidebar and it's a very brief mention that, yeah. Uh, it's believed that two go- two ghosts haunt the Lincoln campus. They say that Lucy was a free-spirited hippie um, who jumped to her death from her dorm. Mm-hmm. And they see her waif-like appearance, or a uh, waif-like specter that appears near Pound Hall, where books supposedly leap from the shelves. Yes. And then there's also a story about a ghost scene uh, in the theater area, mm-hmm. uh, supposedly he was in in the 1940s. Uh, he was uh, fixing some lights overhead or something like that, and he fell to the stage and died. And people say that his apparition appears whenever Macbeth is performed. Um, he was working on that play 
when mm-hmm. he died. Yeah, that would be in the in the temple building. And that's a famous story. Like when you go to school there, everybody knows the temple building's haunted. But I got to tell you, I, I lived in Pound Hall. Uh, oh. <laughs> uh, and just a couple of years ago, though, I was sad. Uh, they they imploded Cather Hall and Pound Hall. The, the, they've been torn down. Oh. Just just re- just in the last couple of years, just like last two years or something like that. I think it's been. Um, but I, I did not witness anything uh, ghostly there. And um, part of the story, too, Cather Pound was also by another hall called Nineheart. And I think Nineheart's still there. I don't think they tore that one down. In the name of progress, you know. There was uh, like a flu epidemic or something. And a, a, a student, they were quarantined to their rooms if they had it. it you know, this is... Decades, decades, early nineteen hundreds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and 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 they say uh, a student died of the flu in one of the rooms of of Nineheart Hall too. But but Pound Hall, yeah, I I live there. So I was like, oh yeah, I know that place. <laughs> well, campuses tend to be some of the most haunted places. Oh, oh, I believe it. I believe it. And in fact, my old music building—they're going to tear part of it down in the name of progress to. Well, it, it need, there, there needs to be some serious upgrades there, but that's another show for another day. But they're going to, uh, you know, kind of knock some of the walls down and build onto it and keep part of it. And and I just wonder if like, if it's called Westbrook Music Building, and I wonder if the spirit of old Arthur is going to be like, hey, what are you doing to my place? What are you? <laughs> <laughs> you don't know. But I, I was really glad to see, I was, I was really happy to see that you wrote about uh, UNL. Uh, University of uh-huh. Lincoln in the, in your book. That, I thought that was great. I thought it was really cool. What a great book too. And so the the story of the book, you're you're um you were working with your publisher to kind of to kind of update. You wrote five uh, or six other ghost books and and just decided to kind of compile some of your best stories and update them and add new material. You said you have a hundred extra pages of brand new material in this book. Yes, new material and updates. There are actually four nonfiction ghost books before this mm-hmm. and the angel book with that publisher. So it was quite a few years ago when I wrote most of the stories. The last book came out in, it was 2008, the last ghost book. So uh, there was a lot I could do to update. Yeah. And, and, what, and, and it came uh, from Andrews McNeil Publishing, Haunted in America, True Ghost Stories from the Best of Leslie Rule. So Leslie, do you uh, do you uh, go out now still and every once in a while, or check things out, or you do most of your uh, ghost sleuthing through the internet, like you said? I do both. Good. I like to go visit a place in person because I really like to be able to look someone in the eye when mm. they're telling me about their ghost sighting. Occasionally, I get the sense that somebody's not telling me the truth that they're they want to be in a book, so they're oh. they're uh, making things up. Um, but most of the time I find people are sincere and I look for validating information. If I find a haunted place, like a hotel where a number of people have either stayed there or worked there, I can usually find witnesses, a number of witnesses that don't know each other. And if they all see the same thing or they describe an apparition in the same way, that's validating. And I was looking, uh, at your website, all your books are available. I see you you got your website there, authorlesliruhl.com. Wherever books are sold, you're published uh, many times over. You got books in every major outlet where you can get a book, including Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, from your website and everything. And and I was just so excited that after reading A Tangled Web and really enjoying that book, and I, I was kind of like, I need to go and uh, get some of Leslie's past books and read them and kind of, you know, follow like her ghost side of things aside from your true crime writing. And then I see this, this news update that this brand new book haunted in America is coming out. And then I, I got a copy and what, what a great book. And thank and, you. And, and it's fantastic. Like 300 some odd pages, just chock full of great research, great stories, your personal stories, your, your kind of your, you kind of speculate a little bit about your theories about things, but you don't push ideas. It's just, it's just such a great book and, and, and filled with your own photography too. I appreciate that very much. I love to hear about people's paranormal experiences. Mm-hmm. And if uh, you, your listeners happen to be on Facebook, they can send me a friend request 
if they like, and they can send me a message about their ghost encounter. Who knows? You may end up on the next book. That'd be great. And maybe if one of my listeners from the Midwest would send in a good ghost story, Leslie will come around here and stop by stop by Omaha sometime. I'll get you a cup of coffee. I need to go back. I I love (laughs) that area. I visited three times when I was working on a tangled web. I know we did a whole episode a number of years ago on that on that book, but it was uh it's so interesting to have somebody come in, an outsider from out of town, and write a book, you know, about a tragedy here in, in Omaha and in Council Bluffs area and to do it with such uh, care. You really wrote the book carefully uh, and, and didn't glorify the murders. You know, I, I always say on this show, I don't really appreciate true crime shows that glorify the acts and the killer. I really appreciate yeah. the, the gumshoe detectives that go through and work to find justice in a situation like that. And, and you did such a great job talking to the uh, investigators and the, the family of the victim and just, just everything else. So uh, my hat's off to you. You're a top Thank notch, you. top notch, true crime writer, top notch, top shelf, paranormal investigator and writer. And, you know, I, I, I put this on Twitter not too long ago. I'm like, when I'm watching these ghost shows and 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 I hear about writers and things like that, I really want your name to be at the like near the top of 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 go to people when it comes to talking about this phenomenon because you, oh thank you because you've done just such a great job with your your research and your writing and it's done with such uh, like I said it's very deliberate and it's carefully written and every every word is important in your book. I, I just uh, well, it's it's a lesson on how to write a book. <laughs> I I appreciate that, but I could not do it unless people confide in me. And that's true with the ghost books and with the Tangled Web about the um, sad death of Carrie Farver. Mm -hmm. I was very fortunate that the investigators opened up to me and shared that Carrie's family and friends shared. uh, The people who knew the killer shared. And she had very intimate details and allowed me to write about them. Everybody got to read what I wrote about them. Everybody but the killer. Right. Everyone who talked to me and shared things. I made sure that I didn't say, write anything that would be upsetting to them. Because you can't always tell how other people feel about that. Mm-hmm. Very, very few suggestions for changes were made. But I honored that. Yeah. And, and like I said, just, uh, just very deliberate, careful writing done with a, with a flair and an uncommon touch. I just, just a big fan of author Leslie rule.com. See how I snuck that in there. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're so sweet. I appreciate that. Great to have you on the show again, my friend. And I, and I, I wish you continued success and keep writing, just keep writing and, and let's, let's go for coffee when you're in Omaha sometime. That sounds great. Look forward to it. Leslie Rule, everybody, on this episode of Necronomicast. Well, there we go, everybody. Leslie Rule, author of Haunted in America. You know, she's written a bunch of ghost books. Coast to Coast Ghosts, Ghosts Among Us, When the Ghost Screams, Ghost in the Mirror, and Where Angels Tread, Real Stories of Miracles and Angelic Intervention, and her true crime book, A Tangled Web love talking to Leslie Rule. All right, you guys, season 13 is upon us. Lucky 13. And with that, the best of the paranormal, true crime, all kinds of stuff. I'm going to throw a couple curveballs your way this year and see if you can hit them. Together, as a team, we're going to hit them out of the park. I announced on Facebook a couple weeks ago my live show in October here in Omaha, beautiful Omaha, Nebraska, Historic Haunted Heartland 2, The Spirits Speak. You hear that saxophone player? He's good. That's Andrew Vogt. He'll be there live on stage. Psychic medium, Cindy Kaza. She'll be there doing a psychic gallery reading live on stage. And The Return of John E.L. Tenney. Lots of details coming your way. Lots of episodes coming your way. Thanks for all that you do for me, for listening to the show, supporting it, telling your friends and neighbors. Buy me a coffee.com forward slash Necronomicast. 
going to help me keep the lights on this year. Honest to God. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. Now go get some sleep. <laughs>